Well, praise the Lord. Let's just stand this morning with the Lord in prayer. I just want to say I'm thankful for your prayers for my mother. She's back in to her place, so that was welcome news, and uh, amen. Praise the Lord. There may be others has prayer requests this morning. <coughs> Sister Margaret? All right. Sister Kathy as well is sick. Was it so? Okay. All right. For my son. And your son as well. All right. Let's all lift up our voice together. Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning, Lord, we are thankful, Lord, that we can come before Thee through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, you've seen these requests that's gone before Thee, and Lord, you knew them before we even asked. And, Lord, as a body, Lord, as we are asking, Lord, that you would meet the needs, Lord, th this time. Bless those that need to ha touch from thee, Lord, those that couldn't be here as well. And, Lord, we are ever so thankful that we can assemble and praise thee and worship thee. In the wonderful name of Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. Uh, Brother Bob, although the finger may be partly damaged, that's not your voice. <laughs> so praise the Lord. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> okay, I'll be careful. <laughs> okay. Praise the Lord. God is good, isn't he? It's just a car, say. <coughs> anyway, somebody find that. <laughs> Blue one.
Praise the Lord. Do you feel good? Does it make you feel good? Number 256 in the same book. My burdens rolled away. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I remember when my burdens rolled away. the glare of fading green, beat the joyful sound, let all the wishing nations 
God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Oh, to the darkest night, His light will shine. God is Oh, dude. 
I'll be true, Lord Jesus, I'll be true.
trust in me. I guess you're loaded down. <laughs> One of you girls sing. <laughs> You've had your time with cadence. <laughs> of doubt hover o'er me, storms of life toss me to and fro, there is a place I can go, he's a shield, every tempest, he's an anchor that assures like me.
wanted to say um, uh, we've been a little bit just thinking about our, our grown children lately and you know they're out at night um, even though we know that they're good children we brought them up well and I I believe they're you know doing okay um, you still have that little those little thoughts and I'm just glad that God is our refuge and we can go to him and uh, you know ask him to take care of our children um, when they're out and we don't know what they're doing particularly and we hope that um, you know they're doing okay and uh, we just have to trust God that they're in his hands They will give their hearts to the Lord. Thinking how much better it would be if we could all live in one accord. But we get so impatient trying to help the Lord bring them in. We end up hurting each other, trying so hard, but just can't win. Pull them out of the fire, bring them in with a burning desire, Lord. Pull them out of the fire. There's not much. We've come so far Thunders have not spoken Grace is almost over So if you could Lord Please pull the mud of the fire We must show kindness, perfect love, and much humility. Our good example might be the only life that they can see. Lord, give us more patience. Keep us out of your way. Lord, we need more patience to know the right words to say. Pull them out of the fire. Bring them in with a burning desire, Lord. Them out of the fire. There's not much time. We've come so far. Thunders have not spoken. Grace is almost over. So if you would, Lord. a burning desire, Lord. Pull them out of the fire. 
thinking about was my wife said to me that when she woke up, just before she woke up, she saw Roger standing up singing the old rugged cross. Would you like to sing it, Roger? <laughs> you? Roger. <laughs> back 30 plus years and I was in a certain place and I was just myself and I was going along and I was singing on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross because a few years before that, I heard a story about a man who hung on an old rugged cross. And it excited me and it thrilled me. And I began to seek God and I received a beautiful treasure in my heart because of what that man had done for me. And there was somebody else, I was oblivious, I wasn't paying attention, and he rebuked me sharply for ever daring to sing that song. It had no effect. <laughs> it's just as real today, many years later, because that God that lives in my heart is real. I uh, just want to say that I struggle tremendously, and most don't, I suppose, but I do. And I'm trying to measure up to a scripture, and I really don't sometimes. <laughs> and the scripture says you're not your own, you're bought with a price. And I find myself being myself. And I have no right to be myself because Jesus was not himself and he gave everything to his father. And there was no self in him. So I don't want to be myself. I don't want to be my own. And if you're praying sometime, you could pray that I won't be myself and that the spirit of God will live in me. I'll sing this this morning or I'll try. On a hill far away st stood an old rugged cross. The end. And shame. And I love that old So this 
sacrificed by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I
and I long to lay that crown at his feet and worship him for what he's done for me. Maybe come up here so everybody can see you. I've got a, yeah, just, just in case. All right, and her name is Louisa Grace. I'm thankful this morning to see our sister and my brother has brought their child to be dedicated to the Lord. It's the Lord that has given it. And we're asking this morning that the Lord would take care of it in the days to come. Let's all bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, as we come at this time, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that thy spirit, Lord, and thy guiding hand, Lord, would be upon this child in all the days of its life. And not only for the child, but, Lord, for the parents as well. And we're so thankful, Lord, that you have called, Lord, her parents at this time. So we thank you, Lord, for Louise Grace, Lord. And, Lord, that you may, Lord, be with her and strengthen her, I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I talked to you a while ago, and I put you to sleep. Now I talk, and put, now you're waking up. <laughs> oh, she's smiling. Oh, praise the Lord. All right, I guess she approves. Oh, watch me talk some more. It's good to know that <clears throat> the Lord is still calling in the hour that we live in of all the things that the Lord has brought us through in this hour. And what a wonderful time to live in. But it's also a trying time that we live in this time. Heavenly Father, if we come to this part of the service, Lord, I ask at this time as we would look into your word, Lord, use this vessel of clay as you would see fit, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we may get a glimpse, Lord, of the things you would have for us, and Lord, the things that are in your word. We ask it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated this morning. <clears throat> I dealt with last week concerning Revelation chapter 1 and how that in that first chapter and we're dealing with verse 12 to verse 16 and how that we see the Jesus standing among the candlesticks and having the stars in his hands 
But as we <coughs> look at this parable, or not this parable, this vision, if you want to, there are symbols that are meant to identify certain inv investors that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to view that, I should use this one here, actually. As we arrive to verse 13, now it says, And in the midst of the candlestick, one like unto the Son of Man. If it had been Jesus, the vision would have spoke that it would have been him. But it was a vision that the angel is portraying. Yes, it's to portray Christ, but it's to portray certain identities and qualities that belong to him. And we have to know where it applies and at what time. <clears throat> and so this first chapter from verse 13 down to verse 16 we're going to see it's a summary of the Gentile church age. It's also the Gentile church age is in the grace age. But the grace age and the Gentile church age, they end at the same time. And so therefore, as we look at this picture, if we put this picture as Jesus somewhere is in the middle of the, the grace age, anywhere is any old place, it doesn't fit because there are some things that are specific. And as we would bring out the different items that the scripture is describing in his description, now don't mind me because I have sort of a <clears throat> frog throat or whatever, whatever you want to call it, horse. So you'll just have to bear with me. As we see him, it is first, I know I'm repeating some things I said last week, but I want to get into something else with it this morning. And this Thursday, after the Thursday night Bible meeting here, I went home and on Friday, there's some things that the Lord has opened up concerning Ezekiel, this picture, Revelation chapter 8 and Revelation chapter 10. Praise the Lord. It's but I'm not going to deal with that this morning. I want to finish off with what I'm looking at here this morning. So now as we see him, he's in the midst of the candlestick. The Son of Man is clothed with a garment down to the foot. It doesn't tell you whether it's blue, white, green, or what. <clears throat> he has a garment. But we know that when you have a resurrected body, if it's to portray Jesus Christ, it is a fine linen garment shining bright and white, if you want to. So now... Don't go to see it on, on just because you see a picture in the sense of the color and those things there. We stick to the word for its descriptions. But nevertheless, now he said, <clears throat> his garment down to the foot and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. That's bottle number two. It must be a long message. <laughs> Glass number two. Okay. So, the thing is, he's girded about with a girdle. Now, we read that, oh, well, what's the difference where he ties his... The, the girdle, girdle is, is a belt. It, it was a belt that you take a long, uh, flat belt, like you have in your house coat sometimes, and you just wrap it over, and there you put it, you put it on your waist. You don't put it up here, because if you don't have no buttons, you're in problems. Now, that's not the problem because Jesus had a completely seamless robe. But what I'm trying to put across is he's not wearing it around the waist. And according to Exodus chapter 28, if he had it around the waist, then this picture would depict to you and I him still being in a high priest position. But this is a summary you have gone through the grace age, and when the, his high priest is over, now you see Jesus, he's seen in the climax of what he's done in the grace age. So now he's no longer high priest in this picture. He is judge. 
And of the types of the day that was given to John on the Isle of Patmos of this vision, judges in those days wore their uh, belt or some sort of garb around their shoulder or the paps or the breast area, which signified as a judge would come in. And to further that picture, if you want to, his head and his hair were white as wool, it was like wool as white as snow. Now, as we are concentrating on his hair, that brings me to Daniel chapter 9, 7, sorry. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. There's only two occasions that you'll find in the Bible of things that are shown in a vision that you have hair white as wool and the two conditions are here in what we see in Revelation chapter 1. Jesus it is to picture Jesus, but he also has an identity of that hair that's white as wool. That is not showing him in his mediatorial work. Because while he was a in his mediatorial work, he was never a judge. He was a high priest and advocate all through the grace age. But as we would pick up a scripture to, to show you this morning that that white hair that's on him is judge. You have to go to Daniel chapter 9. Uh, sorry, uh, 7. Don't mind me this morning. I was, the, the things just fogging my mind a little bit there. So in the 7th chapter, beginning at verse 9, since I beheld and there were cast down Thrones were cast down, and the Angel of Days did sit, whose garments were white as snow, and his head of his uh, the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Yes, all thrones were cast down when? When Jesus come in his physical second coming. But when Jesus come in his physical second coming, he doesn't have hair white as wool. In the millennium, he's not going to have hair white as wool. Now there's another thought to begin with. When we see Jesus in the millennium, he's sitting on this, his throne. He's not going to be pictured as an old man. And he's not going to be pictured at 33 years old either. He'll be at the days of his youth, yes, still having the nail scar in his hand. That is to be a permanent fixture, an identity of who he is. It's not because God couldn't repair the nail scar in his hands. So he will be to the, if we're going to be like him, or if he's going to be like, not that he's going to be like us, but I'll put it this way. If we're going to be like him, you and I are not going to be at 33 years old in the millennium. According to the promise given to Job, it's to the days of your youth. So Jesus in that millennium will be now, in this period of time here, in the days of his youth. Well, I never thought about that. Well, it's not that it's that important, but it's just adding more details of what we're looking at this morning. Now, as we're reading this, yes, the thrones were thrown down here by the day of the Lord. Because mankind was finished ruling, now God was changing the picture that he was going to have his only begotten son to rule and be kings of kings and lords of lords in that millennium. Now, as we see the description of the hair, the wool, the fiery, the fiery, uh, the, like fiery flames from the throne, fiery flame from the throne, that's not the throne he's been sitting on in glory for 2,000 years. There's no flame shooting out of it. Grace and mercy is coming out of her. 
revelations coming out of it. But at the white throne judgment, that will be. And verse 10 cements it in place. And a fiery stream issued came from, forth from him, and thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. This is not dividing the sheep and the goat here, because it says here, the judgment was set and the books, plural, were open. That's your great white throne judgment. There's no books open at the beginning of this millennium here. But all the books are open at the white throne judgment. So the hair, he's, what is Jesus doing on that throne, on that white throne? It's a judgment throne. For what? The saints? No. For the sinners down through all the ages, they're going to be punished. Now their judgment, yes, they're going to be abolished with. But the white hair over here, there's no fiery flame coming out from a throne. But his eyes are like a flame of fire. And what is that to portray to us? What is fire for? The Bible, in, in a short sentence, it says, and our God is a flame, sorry, our God is a consuming fire. Consuming what? Does he like to burn buildings and such like? No, things that don't belong, that he don't like, that's in humanity. And so the, the, the reason it's on the eyes, because why the eyes and not just the throne, is the eyes that look through someone. It's the eyes, he's looking at something with his fiery eyes. What is he portraying here in the, with those fiery eyes? It's none other but the judgment seat of Jesus Christ for your and my reward. Because he's here at the end of the grace age, He's not judging the bride whether she's saved or not, but he's judging her on her rewards. And as we're going to go in this morning to the church ages, the summary of all those ages, it depicts certain attributes and conditions that is going to need to be belong to the believer so when he comes for the day that he's sitting on his judgment seat that he's going to look through with those fiery eyes and things don't belong there, it's going to burn up. Now, remember, he's seen among the stars. He's, this is a heavenly vision. Those eyes are going to be looking at your saints, the see saints down for almost for, during the grace age. So, as you see Jesus depicted, and now it's as much as we can use a picture for, his hair depicts a judge office. And I'd have to say those that are leery about what we're looking at here in Moncton, He don't have white hair all through that grace age. He's not judged during that grace age. He's not judged during the wedding supper. And he's not judged in the millennium. He will judge the earthly uh, people that are in the millennium with a rod of iron. But that's not with his fiery eyes. All right? So where are you going to put that judgment seat of Christ? In that half hour time frame or the seventh seal time factor. Well, however you want to describe it this morning. Now some say, well, the half hour is only about a short time silence in heaven. Yes, I know that part. But when that revelation of chapter 8 opens that time frame and the angel comes, it's more than a half hour for the angel to come, for his voice to cry, the seven thunders to cry, and all the other things that pertains with it, him judging the quick that are living on the earth. You don't put that in a half hour. Read your Bible. But now, as we see Jesus, 
He's pictured having those wool hair shows judgeship. It's the same thing. If you want to show that what that what what hair represents, you look at Daniel chapter seven, verse nine and ten. He's there on that throne. Well, now it's funny here. We see him at the end of the summary of this grace age and the Gentile age, if you want to. He's got white hair. But in the millennium, he ain't going to have no white hair. Because if he's going to have white hair, we're going to have white hair. Now, I know you've got, I read that you've got white hair now. It won't be white then. Okay? And I'll have more than what I've got now. But at the end, so that's pictorially identifying judgeship when it is pictured in the Bible of white hair. And I just want to make that clear. Now, <clears throat> another thing when it comes to judge, oh, but he went to Calvary to judge our sins. He did that when he walked here on earth. That's why his feet are brass. And I know there's young people that has not maybe come across why does brass represent sin judged, complete. The promise starts in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The promise concerning of Jesus to come, he shall bruise thy heel, which is part of the foot, but he will bruise its head concerning Satan. That was in Genesis, in the days of Adam. Then we pick it up again in Moses. But God brings another type concerning brass. The people was disobedient, and serpents was, God sent serpent among them, and a lot of them were starting to die. And they were scared. And they asked Moses, what can we do? And God told Moses, put a serpent on a pole, and make it out of brass, and people that would look at that serpent would live. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. I thought we were looking at we were supposed to look at God. No, it's to look at sin judged. It was a type of what Jesus would be doing at Calvary. So that's why brass represents judgment. Done. Complete. So when Jesus died for your and my sins, it's by one sacrifice he done it. And it's for all times, reaching back to the Old Testament people when he went to the lower part of the earth. It's for them. It's for us and all those that would have eternal life. Brass. His feet are brass here. That's what you picture. Here. And his feet are brass when he comes to the summary where he is judge. Now, as judge is showing, he is worthy to be judged because he has paid the penalty and price for sin. And all judgment, according to John chapter 5, around 26, around that area, the Father has given all judgment to the Son. So who's doing the judgment here when that seventh seal is broke? It is Jesus. At the white throne judgment, who's sitting on that throne? It is Jesus. But now, as we look at it here, only in this hour, not in 2004, not in 63, but in this year, it's been in the scripture, it's been mentioned. But Jesus, that's given the, if you want to, the authority to judge, he's going to judge the dead and the quick, and they're not in the same place at the same time. So the fiery eyes is meant for those at the time when the, when the seventh seal is broke. It tells me he is occupied in doing the judgment of his fiery eyes to the deceased saints through the grace age. All right, through the grace age, those fiery eyes that you see in Revelation chapter 1. 
It's for the dead that are in glory. Jesus himself does not come down to you and I in his resurrected body when that seventh seal is broke. It is an angelic being. That is invested, that Christ has invested in that angel. And the great heavenly father has invested in that angel. So that angel invested with a whole lot of authority. But when you see that angel in Revelation chapter 10 now, his eyes are not flame of fire. It's his feet. Feet don't stand in the air. Feet stands on the ground. And that fire that's in the feet is what's going to burn through the living element that is the quick on the on the earth when that seventh seal is broke. So while Jesus is judging up there with the fiery eyes, that's what that summary of Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 to 16 depicts. That's why he is busy up there with the deceased saints doing the judgment. And I wish people would wake up how can you reconcile Judging, now I don't know what the number is, but let's just say it's a million deceased bride saints. And each one has to come before him individually to receive their reward. There's not warp time or speed up there in heaven just because you are in heaven. And that's going to take some time. So that's why he is pictured here in Revelation chapter 1 as being the judge with his fiery eyes. But it's for those, he's going to be <clears throat> awfully busy with the saints in heaven. And don't tell me that's going to take 30 minutes. Or a year. Or two. Use the figure you want. If Jesus was to give 10 seconds to each one for a million deceased bride saints, you're in the order of three years. Now, whether it's 1 million, 2 million, I don't know the exact number. But there are more than two, half a dozen, maybe. Maybe there are only 2,000 up there, my foot. Somebody that would try to point the picture differently, I show you one that doesn't want to hear truth. Or don't want to look at truth. Because what are you going to do with it? Where are you going to put that judgment seat of Christ? If a million is to come before him, let's put it in so you can catch the picture this morning. If you were Jesus and you had to give an interview, is what it is, to one million people, how long would it take you to interview one million people, if there is one million? It's time to wake up. Well, nobody knows. That tells me, yes, you don't know, but that don't even mean nobody knows. We know this morning. I see the truth. It's just putting the picture together. But now, that angel of Revelation chapter 10, when he comes, his feet is, on, is with fire. Fire is to burn things. He's not coming to burn the earth during the seventh seal time factor, which is this period here. When that angel does come, he's over here. He's dealing with the quick that's down here. And that angel is going to be speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ 
and also on the behalf of Jehovah. When that hour comes, we better have fine linen robe that we're dressed with and not a miniskirt one. You know what I mean by that? It's not fully dressed with truth. I thank God for Brother Branham. I thank God for Brother Jackson. But if that's all you can see, and if you're listening in with a negative attitude, something I want to warn you, you're, it looked like you're being cut off. He says, well, we don't listen to error. Go ahead. But what talent or what pounds will you have when that time comes that seven seal is broke? Not what you receive under tutorship, what have you have now? That don't mean every servant has to have bring new things. As the fivefold ministry was under tutorship and there was a ministry in the hour of Brother Jackson, they had things new and old from that apostolic ministry, which was from Jesus Christ to begin with. Is there an apostle ministry in this hour? You be the judge. Yes, you can speak against someone that's had their, you hear the expression, well, there's all kinds of voices, yeah? Or there's all kinds of er, people preaching things. But somewhere there's got to be one preaching the truth. There's got to be somewhere, somebody, somewhere. And if you speak against God's anointed, that's one thing. But if you, yes, if it's error, then speak of error, then you're in the right. But if you're speaking against God's anointed, then you're in the wrong. I don't mean to bring up this case, but I remember The first convention when Brother Jackson, after he passed away, preached a message that was there, and the ministry that was there didn't believe that that angel of Revelation chapter 10 was an actual angel. On behalf of Christ, it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, there are preachers that won't say anything in front when they're ministering like this. But they'll go behind the scenes because three years later I found out what was taking place. They went to Norway. That brother from Canada is off. He's in error. Well, that brother from Canada didn't bring a third day. That brother from Canada didn't say that even the, ser uh, even the serpent committed an act of sodomy either. Or that hell, that the lake of fire is in the center of the earth. I mean, I have a, there's a list of 18 things, or that was till the 2011. I stopped counting. I said, that's it. They, they've gone in a wrong direction. But they believe they're going into rapture. Yet those things are hanging on them, never been corrected. So one of them went there, and he, as he said that, now one of that brother is no longer ministering. I don't want anyone to befall what has happened that way. But if you touch God's anointed, Sooner or later, God's going to put his finger on you. You may put a nice face before the people, but if you go behind the scene and say, well, that brother there is false, this is all false, be careful. You better make sure that it is. Because if it's not, then you're going to reap the same thing. All right, I just thought, just, anyway. Anyway. So it is dangerous. It's not speaking against the servant that's the problem. Like Jesus said, you can speak against me if you like, 
But if you're speaking against the Holy Ghost and give me this word, then you're on dangerous ground. And that's where the danger. All right. So now, as that angel come, his feet is flame of fire. That's represent it's universal on the earth, not up in glory. So therefore, as that seventh seal is broke, we have walked in to that seventh seal time factor or the half hour time factor. As we are in there, this judgment is going to take place. Yes, Brother Branham, Brother Jackson mentioned, yes, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But in everyone's mind was, it's all going to be up there. And everything's done up there. But we see in Scripture that the Lord has opened up in this hour, not everything is done up there. Things are going to be done down here. That's why Luke chapter 19, verse 15, it says, after he received the authority, where? After the seven seals broke, he received the authority. And then when you read Luke chapter 19, in the 15th verse, it tells you, after he had received the authority, then he actually came, where? He came from glory to the earth. And it says, while he's on the earth, it says, then... Bring these servants to judge them. That's your quick. That's why the feet of that angel of Revelation chapter 10, he's there with the fire on his feet, not in his eyes. Because it's for a small group, and the living element that comes into this half hour silence of time. Not a half hour, 30 minutes. Now, I call it the half hour science of time. It's a time frame factor that a lot of things are going to transpire in it. And next week, I'm going to deal with that angel that's on that altar because there's some things I've seen in Ezekiel that's going to open this thing up. Well, who are you to say things like that? But who are you to say I can't? Are we going to wait till the rapture comes? Uh, not the rapture, the seventh seal is broke. And then find out, oh, well, this never gets revealed. There's a whole lot of things. There's not just that. There's a whole lot of other things. And then you hear, well, there's some people get a revelation every day. That shows a negative spirit. A wrong attitude. And then they say, you're trying to make something of yourself. Any apostle that's worth his salt, he's not going to obey what men are saying, but what the Lord says. And when you start preaching truth, it's going to divide people. Oh, but we're not here for dividing. We're the, the fivefold ministries put the people together. God is still sifting. There's still tears in the church. If there wasn't, we'd be all be seeing eye to eye and seeing the same thing. But we're not. There's no way to sugarcoat this. Well, what about if I had took the attitude, I'm just going to stick with the doctrines of the apostles? And it's somebody else's job. It's somebody's job to do that. Well, whose job is it? Who chooses the vessel that God wants to use? A committee of ministers? No. All right, I'm going off of what... Let's get back on track here. So now let's go back to Revelation chapter 1. And his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet was like unto fine brass, as if it burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Why is his voice like the sound of many waters? 
Well, I'll bring, I don't mean to put you on the spot, it's just to get you to think, to look at the scriptures. In Revelation chapter 3, Behold, uh, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Did you hear a literal voice when he, you were called? Yes, it is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And there's not just one believer. In the bride, there's many believers. So when you look at the book of Revelation, when it says, and his voice, it's like that voice that's calling to the church, not that it is individually, but it's how the Holy Spirit speaks to people that are saved. It's the voice of the Holy Ghost in the bride, that is, many people. This, all right. Sometime it's good to read. Now, this is not new. This is, didn't come from me. God had an apostle to open that up. So now, as we see, Jesus, in this picture, He is judged. He had went to Calvary. He's no longer high priest, but because of the way he's portrayed in there. He doesn't really physically look like that, when, but John was given a vision to portray certain characteristics of what he would be doing when the Gentile age and the Grace Age come to its climax. When that seventh seal is broke, that's when he becomes judge. And if you have a better idea, why don't you preach it instead of saying, no, it's not that? Before you say no, show me your picture. Where do you fit it? Oh, it's up in glory. Yes, but up in glory, is he judging the quick and the dead up in glory? That's impossible. That has to be done here on earth. Of the quick. And how we ministered a number of sermons concerning the judgment seat of Christ for those things at that hour. Now, the eyes of flame of fire, it's not only, oh, I said I was going to deal with the, the church ages as well, how that we look at it. But before I go there, in Revelation chapter 19, which you're not too far away, And in the 12th verse, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Well, first of all, I'll start from verse 11. It's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to destroy the sinners from the face of the earth. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and him that sat upon it was called faithful, true, righteous, and he does what? judge and make war. And his eyes was as a flame of fire. Now he's not going to burn rewards or things in that nature. He's going to burn flesh. Because sinners, he's not going to say, well, I'm going to burn your reward and not touch you. Out of the seven billion people, he may destroy six billion to be a, a remnant left from every nation. And so his eyes was as a flame of fire, and he had on his head many crowns. The saints will crown him. It's been done. Now he's coming in that physical second coming to destroy the sinners. And on his head were many crowns and had a, new, a name written that no man knew but he himself. 
Now, as we would look into the chapter 2 now of the book of Revelation. I'm not going to read the, every chapter of what depicts everything in the chapter. But I'm going to look at the summary of each age. And the summary for one age applies to all seven. Or any age applies to all seven. And when you sum them up of all those things that are summaries of the, each age, it points to you how to get the reward and what's going to happen. Now, in, we have in the Ephesian church age, and that's in verse 7. And he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Plural, there you go. Not just to the church at Ephesus. This was meant for all seven. And to him that overcome, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise. In other words, you're going to have eternal life. And that eternal life leads to your crown. And where do you get your crown? When you are changed in the twinkling of an eye, you are crowned with your resurrected body, eternal life in the full measure. We are not crowned now. Forget it. I don't see no crowns on you, even if I could see in the spirit world. But we will be crowned then. All right. Now, into the Samaria church age. Because remember, this is in respect of the walk and how that is de depicts certain aspects of, our, of the child of God as he's walking in order to be in the right place to receive rewards. And he had an ear, let him hear what the, the Spirit says in verse 11 of chapter 2. And said unto the churches, again, plural, he that overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. Why? Because you have rewards, and in another place we're going to see we're going to rule and reign with him. So therefore, it's a promise. It's a promise in the, in the sense of the believer, he's not going to face that second death at the white throne judgment. Because you're saved and sealed, and going in that rapture, it'll never be changed again. All right. Now, in the Pergamos age, and you're in verse 17 now of chapter 2. And he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. To him that overcome, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. That goes hand in hand with what Jesus said one day. When you receive that comforter, he'll show you things to come, which is the heavenly manna, fresh food, fresh kill, fresh revelation, not past gone, days gone by revelation. The bride needs to live on fresh divine revelation in her, wherever you are in your hour. What we had under tutorship is great. We had plenty of food. But there is food here today. God has promised that he would supply manna even in our day. Not things that you're going to eat on a pie plate or something, but it feeds your soul on the table of your soul. Now we'll give to eat of the manna and give him a white stone and in the stone a new name. Written that no man knoweth, saveth he that received it. So that's some of the things that belongs to our salvation. But then when we get to now this one, Thyatira. Now here, where it's some, some of it up here, in verse 26. It says here, And he that overcome and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now to get power over the nations, as we look at the parables of Jesus Christ, it's he that has reward, that has gained either talents in the parable of Matthew 25, or in Luke chapter 19, uh, 19 has received pounds. 
and he, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as a vessel of a potter. They shall be broken to shivers, and even as I receive of my father. And I will give him the morning star. Praise the Lord. And he that has an ear, let him hear, uh, hear what he, sorry, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches, plural. Now when we come to Luther's hour, which is the, the Sardis church age, and it's found in verse 5, and he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name to my father and before his angels. These are some of the things when Jesus comes and he judges with a fiery eye, he's going to be looking at those things that spoke about here as well. Now Philadelphia, that's in Wesley's hour. In verse 12, He that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go, shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city. You're going to have a city name after you. Well, it's not a physical city like you see Moncton but it is that new Jerusalem. The city of my God, which is, a new, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Oh, well, praise the Lord. Again, it says, let, him, let he that hear with an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Now, this is the one we're interested in, is in this hour. What is the admonition in this hour? And that's in Revelation chapter 3. You're now in verse, well, 20. I'll start from verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If a man hears my voice and opens the door, he don't open the door for you. You have to open that door to, why does it mean to open the door? It means to be non-biased looking at God's word. Because if you're listening to sermons with the preconceived ideas and things trying to find things wrong, the door's closed to you. I don't care how much you claim to be a saint. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit in my throne. How do you get to sit on his throne? Except you have some rewards. So getting back to what it was pointing to in the beginning, it has very much to do with how Jesus is portrayed in that first chapter. He's going to be judged, and he's going to be using these summaries as part of his, if you want to, basis of judgment when he's going to look at you and I. Have you increased in manna? Did you live right? All certain things will take away from your reward. Now, when I look that way, people say, well, I, I, I fall short. I, 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 Lord, will, will I get some reward? Number one, Jesus paid it all. It's never lose sight. It's his righteousness. And you and I are going to grow to the measure the Lord saw us. You and I will not be Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was not born with a sinful nature. You and I have. Yes, we're going to have battles. Yes, we're going to have wars in, in our daily life with the enemy of our soul. But you're not righteous because you made a mistake. He is our righteousness. But then I want to turn it around in this manner. If the true child of God sees that his righteousness, 
he will try as much as is within him to walk in the truth in the way. But never lose sight. It's his righteousness, not yours or mine. All right. So, to sit on his throne, that means you have to have rewards. But it's sad to say in the hour that we live in, According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, those that build on gold, silver, and precious stones, they survive the test, but still end up with some rewards in it. There's maybe some things that may burn, some dross around it. But those rewards will remain. And those rewards is what qualifies you or I to rule with Jesus Christ in the millennium. But if all my rewards are burnt, I'm not bride. I'm white robe. Because the qualification to sit on the throne with him, there has to be some rewards. You have to be doing things right. Not to your mind, but what he wants you and me to do. And what does he want us to do in this hour? Grow! Put on that full revelatory fine linen garment. Praise the Lord. This is an hour, yes, there may be new people, that's fine. But the bride's not always going to be a baby in in pampers. She should be mature as a whole in the time that we live in. Ye are the temple of God. He's called you. He didn't say, well, I see so many things wrong. I don't don't know if I can call him because I see so many things. He sees that you could receive his word because he holds his word above even his name. And because you hold his, name, his word above his name even, then what he says in his word that Jesus, his only begotten son, paid the price for you, it's his righteousness, not mine, not yours. I thank God. Now, there was a video. I want to play a short little video. It may be two minutes. Or can you hang on for two minutes? It was about... Melchizedek, this is in, in the latter years of Brother Jackson's ministry. Uh, okay, I'll have to get this over here, yes. That's one thing to say. Now, why do I, why would I want to play it this way? Well, it's because I know there's controversy about it. We can't go back to the days of Brother Branham or the, day, the beginning days of Brother Jackson. But God allows his prophet to say dual statement and to come up to date. That don't mean you, the prophet's wrong on everything. And neither is Brother Jackson concerning Melchizedek. Look at Abraham in Genesis. You got this mic here on, Paul? Here, maybe I'll put this one. And his name was referred to as Melchizedek, king priest of the Most High God. Now, your theologians of the day will say it, but that was a king priest in of old, the old Salem city, it was not. Because the Jebusites was pagan people. That was not the priest from Salem. It was an angelic being. When that angelic being spoke to Abraham, he gave to Abraham bread and wine. But Abraham gave him a tenth. Now don't ask me what the angel did with it. He just took it out and threw it in the air. See, some people can't even get a picture. But that set a type. That in Abraham, brothers and sisters, is where tithing started.
Then the next time, brothers and sisters, we never see Abraham going back. Oh, I want to see that angel again. That characterized the twofold nature of the Messiah to be. First, he's to be a priest. Then he's coming a king. That characterized those two qualities of the Messiah to be. I wish you would have went to the following verse in Genesis and Melchizedek bless the Most High God. God does, doesn't bless himself. It's an angelic being. So praise the Lord. Anyway, I don't know how I'm going to tackle the things I've seen Friday, but Brothers and sisters, if I bring that out, I know it's going to hear repercussions. If they can't see the judgment seat of Christ, if they can't see that century was over, if they can't see that we're in the, the third watch, all these other things, that they're, not going to, they're going to be lost or not even following along. Are we forcing them? No. But your attitude as you listen to things that are being preached will either cut you off what's being brought forth or you'll re reap the benefit of it if you allow. Now remember when he said about being, uh, when the Lord would come that we'll open the door. He says you have to open that door and the door of your heart to hear it. Not that we open the door to God. That's in, that's for the, that's in Revelation Chapter 3, for the Laodicean church age. So right there shows, now that don't mean we open the door to everything and everything that's being preached, that, that there's everything. Somewhere that Holy Ghost inside should say, this is truth and this is not. And I go back to what I said last Sunday. It didn't take, when Peter preached, and that first group were sealed with the Holy Ghost. 3,000 souls were, is it 3,000? I keep mixing between three and five. Uh, the three and the five. Because if I say it wrong, somebody will say, ah, oh, there, see. So there was 3,000 souls saved. That's in the book of Acts, actually, in verse two, ver, chapter 2, verse 41. There was 3,000 souls saved. Did they go put that on the shelf? Then a little later on, again, in preaching and ministering, there was 5,000 that was added. They had their door open to hear, not biased like the Pharisees did. And when they, had, they were in the right attitude to look at truth, they received there was others standing around. That don't mean there was only 3,000 people there or 5,000 people there. There was others there that were listening. But to those that had the right attitude to open to look at truth. Because if you discard it even before you start, you've cut yourself off. Now granted, for it, I'm going, oh my goodness, getting on overtime again. If you're young, and especially now we're talking about the deep things of God. It's not as if it was in the beginning. These were basic things that come to salvation. Yes, there comes a time God will nurture you. That's why he puts you under tutorship. But somewhere it's in tutorship. We ought to learn how to look at things. It's up to the individual with the Holy Spirit and if you have the Holy Ghost, he'll show you things to come. And not in 20 years from now. Because if I have things on the shelf, by the time that seven seals is broke, those shelves are going to burn. That means, God, you didn't really open up all of your word. 
Nobody knew. Nobody knows. When I hear that, I just... It's just a polite excuse for someone saying, I don't believe what you're saying, or I don't believe what's being brought forth. That's what the denomination did to Brother Branham. That's what the peers of Brother... That was under Brother Branham when Brother Jackson was there. When they came forth, they'd done the same thing to Brother Jackson. They had preconceived ideas, and they didn't want to hear what he had to say. And when he started bringing in truth, it really separated the crowd. It separated the crowd, not the Pentecostals, not the churches here and there. It separated those of his peers. I wish it were different. It's just like when Jesus preached the truth, how many went into the upper room? 120. Out of 3,500 Jews in the land that should have known their Messiah. 500 seen them go up. All right, I've, uh, I'm getting bad in my old age. Isn't I? All right. Uh, there's a time to cut things off, and there's a time. Because you say too much, you forget too much. So let's just stand at this time. Since I was over time, we'll just dismiss, unless someone had need of prayer. But All right, Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, I thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us, Lord, and I thank you, Jesus, you're still on that throne of mercy. And I thank you, Lord, for the heavenly man, our Lord, and Lord, the carcass is still available in the hour that we live in. Now, Lord, give us traveling mercy on the highway. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, amen and amen. Lord, bless each one.